Hi, everybody. Welcome to the, the March Public Global R&D. Um, I'm Manu, I'm the MC today. And um, I think it's safe to say that this, this time we have a particularly exciting agenda with developer experience upgrade, um, the developer experience updates, but then also I think four very exciting demos that uh, that we have planned. Um, so let's let's get right into it. And of course, always feel free to put your questions in the chat and hopefully we have time to cover them. So then jumping in, Jason, can you tell us what's happening on the DX front? Thank you, Manu. Um, hi everybody, I'm Jason, engineering manager. Uh, and I'm gonna kick off today's global R&D with an update on developer experience. As some of you may know, uh, we collect developer experience feedback on something called the ICP feedback board. Um, the topics that get posted there ultimately influence our development roadmap and help us improve the usability of our libraries and tools. So for the month of March, I'm going to give you some of the statistics uh, for uh, developer experience topics and how we address them. So in the month of March, uh, seven DX improvements were shipped, eight were scheduled. So uh, we're going to start work uh, on, on those in the coming months, on the coming weeks, I should say. Two new uh, topics were created and three topics were closed. And let me give you some highlights of what we accomplished this month. Next slide, please. So one, um, we've increased the size limit of the WASM modules that you can install in your canister to 100 megabytes. Um, this will help you scale your dApps as your needs continue to grow. Better warnings in Matoko. So the compiler will now print a warning if there are any unused identifiers present in your code. The FX dashboard. So this is a community project. It's a native electronic application that wraps DFX commands and provides some project management capabilities. Um, it's currently in beta, and we think a lot of folks are going to love using it to manage their projects and interact with their canisters. Uh, next slide, please. Some improvements to dfx.json. You can now buy your canister IDs directly in dfx.json, um, addressing a gap and a sought after community need. Um, so let's talk about what's coming next. Uh, next slide, please. So the ability to download DFX from a mirror, uh, that are Chinese developers who may have trouble accessing GitHub. This will be coming soon. Uh, we'll be adding a new install mode that will allow developers to skip the pre-upgrade hook during the upgrade process. And uh, spoiler alert, the cycles ledger will improve the way that you send and receive cycles, deploy canisters, and so on. And we'll see a, a sneak peek of that uh, later today. Um, so next slide, please. As you can see, there's plenty of good stuff coming. Please stay tuned and vote for your favorite topics on the feedback board. I'll be back next month and provide you with some more updates. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Manu. Thank you very much, Jason. That was a very nice uh, list of, of, of improvements. I, I, I'm sure ICP developers everywhere will be very happy. Um, yeah, so here is the link. If you have any 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 suggestions, uh, you can see that you know we listen to the feedback and uh, um, let's let's then move on to the demo segment of this of this session. And the first demo is Ulan with an AI demo. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Ulan. Uh, I work in the runtime team here at Definity. Uh, I assume everyone has seen this demo that Dom uh, gave last week that showed. Uh, image classification running inside the canister. And today I wanted to follow up on that demo and kind of give more technical details about it, explain what features of the internet computer made this demo possible, and also talk about upcoming features and optimizations we are planning to do uh, to improve such compute heavy workloads uh, that are used by this demo, for example. Uh, before I go there, let me, so this is a, canister uh, I installed on a testnet. Uh, and this is like the same canister that Tom showed. Uh, and uh, here uh, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to address one issue uh, that we saw in Dom's video and demo. And that is the example of the car that was used, uh, example of the image that was used for a car and uh, due to 
popular demand, I'm going to use this one. Uh, uh, so when I click go, uh, what it's going to do, uh, it's going to send this image to the canister. And then the canister will perform this image classification and return the results. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, uh, I need to mention that uh, the, this wasm execution and this workload is not optimized at all right now. So that's why it's going to run like uh, for about 10 seconds, I think, and is using a lot of instructions. Uh, and yeah, well, now we have the results. So that's uh, the top three labels uh, returned from the model along with their scores. So when user, uh, I sent this image to the canister, uh, the canister is running this uh, image classification uh, and it is implemented like with two components. Uh, first one is the inference engine. Uh, and this is an existing open source inference engine that we took and compiled to WebAssembly. And the second component is actual model itself that was trained to uh, recognize the images. And this was also readily available. Uh, we took it uh, as an, from an open source project. And uh, when the canister receives the image, it calls the inference uh, engine uh, to process it and then returns the results. Uh, now, there are two important features of the internet computers that make this demo possible. Uh, first, uh, the internet computer uses WebAssembly as a virtual machine, and it also supports uh, some WebAssembly standards, for example, uh, the one called WASI. And what it means, it means that internet computer supports powerful and general purpose computation. And this allows us to take the inference engine and put it inside the canister. Uh, the compilation process that I showed in the previous slide was not as straightforward. Uh, that's because the, that particular inference engine, it supports compilation only to the target that's known as WASM32 WASI. This is like the standard uh, WebAssembly binary format that's used outside of the browsers. Uh, this format is not directly usable on the IC, so it's not directly compatible, but thanks to our community, we have a tool called wasi to ic that can take such binaries and transform them into WebAssembly binaries that can run uh, on the IC. And what I really like here is that one of the crucial parts you know, for this demo was provided like by community last year, so not, not done by Definity. Uh, another important feature, and I think it's a unique feature uh, of the internet computer, and it's the ability to take a long running computation and slice it, slice it into chunks and execute each chunk across multiple blocks, right? Like uh, each chunk within one block, uh, so distributing the entire computation across multiple blocks. Uh, this is called deterministic time slicing. It's been implemented a while ago. And uh, uh, for comparison, like when we launched at Genesis, uh, we didn't have DTS, deterministic time slicing, and the instruction limit was at most 5 billion instructions. Now we support 20 billion instructions in update calls. Uh, so it's like 4x more compute available. And right now we are in the process of rolling out a new replica version that is going to increase this limit even more to 40 billion instructions. And we are also planning more and increases in the future. So like, I think these are the like, two uh, interesting or important features uh, of the internet computer. Uh, now, let me give more details about the demo code itself. Like for those who are interested, I put it on GitHub. It's available on our Definity examples repository and you can reach it using this link or QR code. Uh, as I said, it's using uh, an existing inference engine that's open source. It's called Sonus Tract. Uh, we chose it because it seems to be the only engine that supports some compilation to at least some of the uh, Wasm targets, like uh, uh, like outside of the browsers. And uh, as a model, uh, we used the model called Mobile Net. Uh, it can classify an input image according to 1,000 image classes from this ImageNet data set. 
And the model is relatively small, it's 13 megabytes. But as I said, the current Wasm execution is not optimized for like such compute heavy AI workload. So the demo is executing about 24 billion instructions, uh, which takes about 10 seconds. And I think with the optimizations that we are working on, this can be improved by about order of magnitude, right? And that would kind of correspond to actual real compute that's happening uh, in this uh, example. Uh, now, uh, what we are working right now are first these optimizations. Uh, we found that uh, the, oper the floating point operations and the features that we use to make floating point operations deterministic uh, is slower than we expected. So we are now looking into uh, why that's the case and trying to uh, optimize that case. And another thing uh, what we are planning is to enable uh, single instruction multiple data extension of WebAssembly that allows within a single instruction to perform up to four floating point operations. So, like, and uh, our hope is that these two uh, optimizations combined will give us like about order of magnitude improvement in this case. Uh, uh, we are also looking into Wasm 64. Like uh, right now, all the canisters, they are using 32-bit WebAssembly, which means that their main memory is limited to four gigabytes. And in order to go beyond that, we need 64-bit WebAssembly. Uh, we will also continue increasing the instruction limit for updates. And we are started exploring uh, this idea that was uh, suggested by community that we could make query charging opt-in in order to, for developers to also increase the instruction limits in the queries, because that's like the main blocker for increasing instruction limit in the queries is that there is no query charging. So th this is like the work we are planning to do in short term, I guess. And that's all from my side. Thank you. Really cool to see uh, that this is even possible. Cool, yeah, so it's open source and available to, for, for people to, to play around with. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And yeah, a really cool demo. I think it very nicely shows the power of stuff you can do in a smart contract on the IC. So that's, that's super exciting. Let's move on to the next demo, and that's the Cycles Ledger. Uh, and I think Thomas and Severin are going to be presenting. So I'm going to present an exciting new feature that should improve developer experience, in particular when it comes to the management of cycles. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. So what you can see here is the unsuccessful attempt of a developer who's probably new to the ecosystem, and he just tries to get his canister deployed on the IC. Uh, so what happened here is uh, that user called VFX deploy, which didn't work because there was no wallet configured. Uh, and then learning that, well, you need a wallet and the wallet is essentially canister. The user tried to create a canister, which also didn't work because no wallet is configured. And there's no need to go through all the steps here in detail. So the user eventually managed to uh, burn some ICP to create a canister, uh, but the subsequent DFX deploy call still failed because no wallet is configured. So all that uh, confused user managed to do is burn some ICP, but without uh, reaching the goal of deploying a canister. Um, but that is, of course, an artificial uh, interaction between a user and DFX, but it is actually a real challenge to deal with uh, cycles and uh, wallets, uh, in particular for newcomers. Uh, next slide, please. So what you can see here is a screenshot uh, taken from the developer experience feedback board where the ticket to remove the cycles wallet, which is uh, considered confusing and a laborious solution, uh, received quite a few upvotes. So, and this is exactly the problem that we are addressing with this feature. Next slide, please. So, and one of the key components that we're introducing is a new DFX command, DFX cycles. And the, in, the idea here is to provide a very straightforward interface uh, for developers uh, for all things related to cycles management. Uh, on the next slide, you see some example calls uh, and for very straightforward actions that a user might want to do. 
So if you want to know your balance of cycles that you have at your disposal, you run the effect cycles balance, and it will tell you how much how many cycles you have. If uh, a friend or coworker needs cycles, uh, you can very easily transfer cycles by calling the effects cycles transfer. You specify the target and the amount you want to send, and that's it. Uh, if you have a canister that is running low and you wish to top up that canister, you run the effect cycles top up and provide the canister you'd like to feed with more cycles. And if you're running low on cycles yourself, uh, you probably want to convert ICP to cycles, and you do that through DFX cycles convert, uh, providing a certain ICP amount, and your uh, account is uh, going to be increased by, by the corresponding amount of cycles. So now returning on the next slide to our hapless developer, uh, ideally, the flow would then look something like this. So after the unsuccessful DFX deploy call, now the response would indicate that there's simply not enough cycles available for the deployment. Then if the user knows there is this cycles convert call, uh, the user can get cycles and the subsequent DFX deploy call would then succeed, just taking cycles from the user's balance. All right. Uh, so. Knowing that only canisters can actually hold cycles, so the natural question is, how does that feature actually work? And that is shown on the next slide. So in the background, DFX talks to a new global ledger called the Cycles Ledger, which essentially acts as a bank of cycles for, for users. So you can de uh, deposit your cycles there, you can transfer them, and you can also withdraw cycles to top up canisters. And the great thing about the cycles ledger is that it's, it is an ICRC1, uh, ICRC2, and ICRC3 compatible ledger. So even the new, the brand new ICRC3 uh, token standard is supported as well. And that means that any uh, canister that wishes to integrate with the cycles ledger can do so using the standard uh, endpoints. So, and that is, the theory part. And next slide, please. And now Severin will uh, show a live demo that showcases some of the features of the Cycles Ledger and the new DFX Cycles command. I'm Severin. I'm the engineering lead on this on the Cycles Ledger feature, and I will show you how it actually works already on mainnet and with the latest DFX beta version. As you can see, I'm running here the DFX beta version that came out uh, for me last night, for some of you maybe yesterday or today. Um, and to um, opt into um, the beta version, we have to set this environment variable to anything. And now um, DFX knows that if you don't have a Cycles wallet set up, then you want to use the Cycles Ledger. So um, we're starting simple. I'm checking how many cycles I have right now. Um, side note, small convenience feature we added recently. The dash dash IC is a shorthand for network I see. I'm sure that's going to save a few seconds for some of you quite a few times. So now with those cycles, we can try to do the flow that Thomas showed before. We're going to deploy our project. But of course, since we don't have any cycles or barely any cycles, that's not going to work out. So we need to get some cycles. And for that, I'm going to use the help of Thomas. We are now on the screen of Thomas. And he's going to send me a few cycles. Um, I already um, copied over my own principle, and now we can simply do
just do the transfer network IC. We send it. I didn't copy that properly. We send it to my principal, and we're going to send five trillion cycles. Another small convenience feature we added recently, you don't have to type zeros anymore. You can type T for trillion, B for billion. If you prefer, you can also type TC for trillion cycles. It all should work as expected. And with that, Thomas sent me some cycles. Thank you very much for your support. And now you can see I have 5 trillion cycles more. And with that, we can do the effects deploy to network IC. And since you all have seen how deployments work, I'm going to show you one more uh, thing that we added as part of the cycles ledger work. We can now target different subnets for our deployments. Um, in this case, we're going to say we want to be on the same subnet as this 6VVCS canister. Um, if you don't specify any subnet, then if your project lives already on one uh, subnet, then it's just going to deploy to the same subnet. If you have if this is the first canister in your project that you deploy, it's going to choose a random one. Or you can also say uh, explicitly which subnet you want to go to with dash dash subnet. Or there's also the subnet type if you want to land on the fiduciary or the European subnet. So let's try to do that. Um, in the background, DFX checks with the registry canister which subnet this canister lives on, and then tells the cycles ledger that it should go to the cycles minting canister and create a canister on that subnet. Since this uh, uses multiple cross subnet calls, it's going to take a little longer than usual, but we should get the canister in no time, and here we go already. And with that, we can see the canister is running. Now, just to check if the subnet actually worked, here's the call to figure out the subnet for the canister we said we want to land next to. And here's for the canister we just created. And you can see we are indeed on the same subnet. And that's all that I wanted to show you for today. Back to you, Manu. Thank you, guys. That was a very, very nice demo. I think we all felt some pain of the cycles mm -hmm. while before. So uh, uh, I, I, I'm sure this will be very well received. I saw one question by, by Or that was not answered yet. So he mentioned that at the moment, dealing with cycles uh, in local development is kind of transparently handled by DFX. Will that, will that still be the case or will that change with, with this new cycle ledger? Yes, this will stay the same as now. And uh, yeah, we don't want to deal with that pain ourselves. Um, of course, if you set some weird environment variables, yeah then you may have to use the cycles ledger, but in general, it's going to work just as before. Great. Thanks for the nice demo. Um, uh, there may be more questions in the chat, but let's let's move on to the, to the next demo, um, which is canister logging. Uh, Maxim, tell us more. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Maxim. I'm a software engineer in the execution team. And today I'm going to be talking about canister logging. What is canister logging? 
It's a new experimental feature that allows canister developers to read log messages even when the canister was trapping. And why do we want to have this? It is because previously canister developers were not able to see any errors. For example, if users call a canister and this call traps, then the user gets the response with corresponding error message, but those are not visible to the canister developers. And it gets even worse uh, for heartbeats and timers because those methods do not require a user to do anything. They do not have to be called by user. They are called automatically. And therefore, if the trap happens in the heartbeat or in a timer, then those are completely silent. And if the canister developer decides to write some information du during this call and trying to store it in the canister state, it will not work just because uh, in the case of a trap, all the changes to the canister state gets dropped and never actually saved into the canister state. So there was no way to preserve logs. And to fix that, we added a special circular buffer, which is of four kilobytes in size at the moment. And that is preserved in the canister state, even if the uh, call trapped. So this buffer, holds the debug prints and trap messages, and those logs can be read by using new defix command called canister logs. Those logs are uh, visible to controllers only by, by default and can be changed to public uh, through canister settings. We believe that that is a simple yet functional implementation that can be expanded uh, to a more comprehensive solution in the future. So this is my code editor with the canister and the terminal. In terminal, you can see I'm already running a DFX. Uh, it's a custom build, so it's, uh, this feature is not available in the DFX yet, but is going to be in the upcoming DFX releases. So now I'm switching to another terminal uh, windows because we don't need uh, this window with the uh, running the fix. Um, so right now, let me deploy the canister and wh wh while it's being deployed, uh, I'll talk about this method. This is a method of the canister print that prints the message into the console. But at the same time, it is expected to save this message into the logs. So to read the logs, I will use this common kinds. Oh, sorry, kinds logs demo. That's the name. Sorry, demo. Yeah. Sorry about that. So there are no logs. That's expected, and uh, let's call this method and let's see what happens. So the method is called, and we have our first entry into the lab, into the logs. Uh, it has an index, the timestamp, and the log message. Let's try something else. And the second message gets into the logs. Uh, I have several uh, examples, and I don't want to call uh, this comment every time, so. Let me call uh, a script that just pause this uh, comment uh, every second. And let's try to check if it works. Yes, it does. Uh, awesome. So let's take a look um, at another example. This one is a heavy path. So it works, it prints, everything is perfect. What would happen if after printing, we actually trap. So the call failed. Uh, the caller got the response message with the 
uh, error message, but at the same time in the logs, we can see the message right before the trap and the trap message itself. Awesome. Let's take a look at what happens almost in a similar case, but instead of calling trap, I will call panic. Here it is. So we get uh, again the message right before the panic and the panic message itself with the path to the line where the panic actually happened. Uh, those were examples where I explicitly called trap and panic. Uh, let's take a look at another example, uh, which is not that explicit. I'm trying to read a stable memory uh, outside of the bound. So I have a buffer of the size 10, but I am reading outside of uh, the bounds. Let, let's see what happens in this case. The call itself expectedly failed with the message that the uh, stable memory out of bounds, but in the logs, we have both the message right before the memory out of bounds and the trap message itself. Nice. Uh, another example where I'm trying to convert some nonsense into a UTF-8 string, and uh, it is expected to fail too. So we have a little bit uh, more of a boss error message with all the UTF-8 conversion information. And as usual, we have the information, the, the, the printed message right before the failed unwrap and the panic uh, message itself. Nice. Uh, let me clear that. And uh, those were the examples when I, as a user, we are calling specific methods on the canister. Let's take a look at the example uh, when, we, when we use timers and heartbeat. Let's start with the timer. Uh, in this case, uh, every three seconds, the timer will be printing this message and will be calling a trap. Uh, and to start this, I need to redeploy the canister. As soon as the canister gets deployed, every three seconds, the timer will start executing uh, this code. And you will see in the logs, we get the message and the trap message. So let me comment that back and do almost the same in the heartbeat, but uh, just for a change, I'll be panicking in the heartbeat. And again, redeploying the canister. Timer traps stopped and the heartbeat panics started. Uh, let me stop this noise. And let me stop uh, following the logs. I would like to take a look once again into the whole canister logs that I had in this presentation. I'm scrolling up and you can see uh, I have all the logs starting from the beginning, from saying hi, hello, hey, and stuff. <clears throat> and then the timer was trapping and heartbeat was panicking all the way down and uh, every log entry has an index and uh, the timestamp and uh, yeah that's basically all the examples i wanted to show i would like to say thank you to islam for designing the feature and the execution and run teams for uh, reviews also to sdk team for helping with the dfx integration and I would like to remind everyone that that is an experimental feature and it's going to be available in the upcoming DFX release. So please use it and give us your feedback. It will help us to improve the feature and make it more um, uh, fitting to your needs. That's basically everything I wanted to show you in this demo. Back to you, Manu. Thank you, Maxim. Very nice demo. And <laughs> I think... Everybody that ever tried to debug a canister with a trapping timer will be particularly grateful for this feature. Um, so yeah, very nice work. I think it'll be super useful for many developers. I see no questions, so, so let's move on to, to the last demo of today, which is the community demo. So um, uh, Zcloak, please uh, uh, take it away. 
Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for your time. So I'm the founder of Ziklog Network. I'm going to share uh, the project we're building. It's called Chain Abstraction-Based CK Coprocessor on the ISC. Um, so the quick message, we have built a canister for zero-knowledge proof verification on ICP and for privacy-related applications. And on the right side is the website and Twitter of our project. And we'll go through this presentation by introducing the problems we faced with the CKP verification, why we chose IC for doing that, the product architecture, a quick demo, and plans for future developments. Okay, so the problem, uh, we know that uh, zero knowledge proof is a very fast developing area in, uh, in Web3 and has uh, very interesting applications for privacy related applications, for example. And normal uh, uh, ZKP verification we are seeing right now are usually done in Ethereum, but we are observing many issues. Uh, it is uh, time consuming, it's uh, slow, it's a uh, very high cost, and the proof size has a limitation due to the uh, call data in transactions, and it lacks uh, interoperability. So basically the proof can only be used in the chain, which uh, does the verification. Now we propose uh, to have a, something we call a ZK coprocessor built on the internet computer, which can provide trustless, low cost, efficient, and uh, it also provides a multi-chain interoperability for ZKP verification. The use cases right now are uh, focused on privacy related applications for identity, medical, and financial apps. Okay, so why do we want to build this now? We know blockchain is transparent ledger and everybody basically can see everything on the blockchain. But for real world applications, we do need privacy and we also have regulations for data and across borders and things like that. So it's absolutely important if we want to use it for uh, crucial applications. And right now we are seeing limitations in Ethereum if we want to do CKP verification. Already said it's expensive and we have high latency. And the reason we chose uh, IC for doing this is that it provides some unique uh, advantages for doing uh, ZK verification. Basically it's efficient, it's a very fast computation, it's cost is low, and also has a low latency. It has great tooling for support of Watson. So the ZKP part from our project is based on Watson. So that's great. And interoperability with the chain key technology, we can reuse the verification result in a target chain that we want. And it's a user-friendly, especially reverse gas fee feature so that users don't need to have any gas or anything to use our uh, ZKP verification canister. The product architecture is like so. So for uh, our project, we use a project uh, uh, called Polygon Maiden. It's uh, known for uh, providing a general purpose zero knowledge virtual machine. So the, the project is divided into two parts. The left side is the zero knowledge virtual machine, which runs in user client. Uh, it could be a wallet in their cell phone or a web page in their computer. And this virtual machine holds something that we call a ZK program, which is basically the type of computation we want the user to do in their client device. For example, uh, proving that your age is over 20 or your income is within a certain range. And this ZK program will use two types of uh, input. One is public input, one is a secret input. Within this secret input, you can hold your private data. So basically you can use your private data to do some local computation. You generated the output, you generate the ZKP. Uh, you can prove to the outside world you have certain attributes or qualifications without disclosing your secret input data. That's the basic idea. And on the right hand side is basically the canister that runs on the IC. Users generate the proof. The proof is sent through HTTP to the uh, canister for uh, ZKP verification. And the result is either a true or false. Uh, it can be signed by the canister using threshold ECDSA. And the result can be again sent to any uh, target blockchain like Ethereum, uh, Arbitrum, or even Solana, if the user choose to do so, and the result can be reused over there. So here is a general architecture of, uh, of the design that we have so far. Uh, some quick comparison of the results. 
uh, for doing basically the same stark proof verification on ICP and on EVM chains. So it's really cheap uh, in terms of cost. Basically, it's just two US dollar cents for doing the proof verification and the uh, chain key signature. Well, compared to Ethereum, if you want to throw a large stark proof blob into Ethereum and do the verification, that'd be thousands of US dollars. It's very efficient, so we get a finality of uh, two point, uh, uh, basically two hundred milliseconds for stark proof, and you can you simply cannot do this in Ethereum because uh, there's a limitation of uh, of uh, the uh, call data in the transaction. So we have to chop the proof into several pieces and do the proof uh, verification uh, in several blocks, and that leads to uh, uh, propagation delay. And for the users. And sometimes if you want to do proof uh, aggregation, that means using one large proof to prove many small proofs, you have even more latency uh, for this method. Interoperability, um, no need to say that SP uh, uh, solution provides interoperability with other chains. Well, in EVM chains, you can only use the result in the chain which verifies this proof. And user experience in ICP requires no gas fee. Users don't need a wallet yet for the proof generation and the proof verification. So it's very convenient for them. But at the Ethereum side, we know that you need a wallet, you need a gas fee to do everything. So it's very nice result we're getting so far. And now we'll go to a quick product demo that we have done. So basically we have built a game for this purpose to showcase the capability to do proof uh, uh, generation and verification uh, using the canister. The quick idea is that uh, uh, you, you have a character that walks in a maze, and there are multiple shortest paths to, to exit this maze. So with the ZKP, you can prove to people that you have uh, walked out of this maze through the shortest path without disclosing exactly which path you chose. Right. So uh, first, we want you to connect uh, uh, your MetaMask wallet so that you can send the result to a EVM chain. And basically, you can use your arrow to direct this character to walk in the maze. And we chose the shortest path to walk to the uh, exit. So when this finishes, uh, the web page uh, will generate a zero-knowledge proof locally uh, in Watson. And now it has been done. And we choose to want to uh, send the verification result to Arbitrum, for example. Now the proof is actually sent to the internet computer for verification. So it will take a little bit of time, um, mainly due to a network delay. So the proof will be verified and then it will be signed by the canister. And now you can post the result to Arbitrum with a threshold signature. And our smart contract in Arbitrum will recognize that you have finished the game and you are entitled to claim the SBT for playing this game. So if you uh, uh, check the uh, like OpenSea network in the chain, you will see that you have got this SBT for playing the game, and you've got the shortest genius, shortcut genius SBT. Okay, so this is the quick demo. It basically shows that you can do local uh, um, proof generation, and you can do verification in the uh, IC canister. Okay, so I'll continue with my presentation. Um, that's basically the work that we have done. Future plans for this uh, for this project uh, will include a more proof system. So we mentioned we use Polygon Maiden uh, uh, for the time being. We'll also include Risk Zero and SP One, which were pretty hot in Ethereum these days uh, as proof systems for people to use. Right now, our our own teams already have two practical use cases. The first one is the one that Zcloak has been building for a very long time, we call it ZKID. Basically, it's a privacy preserving identity uh, solution, which lets you do local computation on your identity data for KYC, for medical applications, for insurance, so that you don't have to show your private data to the outside world to, uh, to use some applications. The second one is uh, something that we have just started. It's called ZKPay for quick uh, and short name. Um, the quick idea is that we want to uh, use the chain abstraction concept to do private transactions for stable coins and for CBDC. And we are already in contact with the central banks of some countries who are very interested in this uh, solution and also stable coin issuers who 
people have realized that if they cannot protect the privacy for their stablecoin, it will be very difficult to use uh, for large scale use in e-commerce or B2B environment. So this is something that they are very interested in. And our team is definitely open for collaboration. If you're interested in uh, ZK use case, please contact us and we can discuss how we can uh, uh, collaborate on this topic. And here's a quick introduction to our, to our team. So basically we are kind of uh, new in IC, uh, uh, ICP uh, uh, ecosystem. So we worked in Ethereum, we worked in Polkadot before, and our team uh, were developing Solidity and Rust code for, for a few years. Now we realize that so with the capability provided by uh, the uh, IC uh, protocol, we can do very interesting things um, with zero knowledge proof. So that's why we have uh, built this canister for CKP verification. And we really hope that uh, with the help of the uh, Definity team and also community project, we can do something that's useful and interesting together. Okay, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Very, very exciting demo. I see a lot, a lot of excitement in the chat though. It's super well explained. And uh, yeah, I think a very nice use case of, of multi-chain combining the strength of, of the compute power of ICP with, with other chains. So very well done. Um, I, I have one question for you. Like um, you said, you're planning to use this for your for your identity product. Is this is this already the case, or can we? Is this is this a plan for the future? Yes, it is already. Uh, uh, we have developed a W three C DID and a verifiable credential protocol, and also implementation uh, for this already. And we lacked the zk part, which will let you do computation on our identity data locally in your mobile phone. So this is the part we're missing. And now it's, it's here. So basically we can uh, add everything together and provide a, a complete solution for private identity. Very cool. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Let's see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, no, lot, lots of praise in the chat. So you have to check that out. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Zcloak, for, 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 for the demo. Um, very exciting project. Um, that is, I think, also the last demo. So then um, thanks so much for all the presenters, all the exciting demos, and thanks everybody for joining. You have a couple minutes left, so you can go solve some zero knowledge mazes now. And I hope to see you all at the next uh, Global R&D. Bye, everybody.